This is a Hot Pie Media Original. This podcast is sponsored by Better Help. H E L P. Help. Better Help. Now, is there something that's interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? You know, Everybody who listens to Stop Self-Sabotage has something that they want for themselves that they are not getting because they feel that they're frustrated or they wouldn't be listening. They want more. And personally, when I first became a therapist, I went into therapy because I was so hurt in an emotional relationship and I wanted to repair that. And better help is a place that you can do just that for yourself. Better help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's a professional therapy done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your therapist. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change therapists as needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. One of them is, Anthony wrote, Karen is great. She's attentive, gives great advice, and really makes you think about your issues so you can resolve them in a fashion where you are comfortable. Visit betterhelp.com slash S-S-S, that's better H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp, they are now recruiting additional therapists in all 50 states. We have a special offer for you. For Stop Self-Sabotage listeners, you get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp dot com slash SSS. As a therapist myself, I can't recommend them more sincerely. Go online, talk to them. They will be very attentive to your needs and they will get you the help you want. Hi, this is Pat Pearson. We are here with Stop Self-Sabotage and we're here with Dr. Eric Corum. Hi, Eric. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. You bet. My pleasure. And um, you were also a host on Hot Pie Media on, yes. on The Blueprint, uh-huh. which I have listened to and learned a lot from. Um, I took some notes from him. Gosh, of course, brain. A um, man named Steve was on not too long ago. Really bright guy. Wrote Steve a- Shimbaum? Yeah. Oh, oh no. Oh, um. Yeah, Steve, uh, author of The Passion Paradox. Yes. Yeah, yes, Steve yes, Magnus. Yes, yes, yes. A little g- good notes. Yeah. Very really, really smart guy. So tell us about you. Tell us yeah. about your company. Yeah. So uh, I've spent about 16 years prior to a career shift I had in 2020 um, working in collegiate and professional sports as a yeah. sports scientist. So what I did was is uh, we would collect data on athletes and we would use that to improve their performance. And along the way, I got a doctoral degree and I studied sleep because when I was looking at God bless you. Yeah. <laughs> when I was looking at things to study, I was like, okay, what is something you can't live without? Can't live without water, can't sure. live without food, you can't live without sleep. Right. And so I wanted to understand how sleep impacted athletes and more particularly how it impacted their ability to adapt to stress. Yeah. So I wanted to understand what sleep was because it's kind of this all encompassing phenomenon. That there's still so much to be learned about. Sure. And um, what we did in my for my doctoral work is we looked at how sleep impacted our athletes brains ability to adapt to stress, both physical and psychological stress. I bet. And so I really enjoyed that. And then um, in 2020, I had a big career shift and uh, I left sports and I started a company called AIM7. 
And what we do is we use wearable technology like your Apple Watch or, or Ring and we turn it into healthy habits and we help people with things like sleep, energy and stress. And so, um, the problem with these, am I looking at this, one of these wonderful things? Yeah. So I got actually got three on, I have my my Apple watch, I have a whoop and I have an aura. (laughs) And the reason it's kind of like, you know, you you study wired. I know (laughs) I have to, these are devices that we use. So I'm constantly testing things, but yeah, like the problem with all these devices is they're really great at collecting data, but they don't tell people what to do with it. Good point. So we fill in that gap and we're like, you want to improve your sleep? Here's use this data and then we'll, and then we're going to deliver you the, the best uh, content, how to improve your sleep. And then we're going to help you learn how to wire in these new habits. You want to um, improve your energy level. We have all this cool stuff. So it's a free app. It's at aim7.com. Aim7.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A I M and the number seven. Yes. Dot com. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. I'm on it. Well, not right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Soon. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So let's let's kind of do this trifecta a little bit. Mm-hmm. Sleep particularly. And mm-hmm. and I say this as a, a sufferer of sleep mm-hmm. problems. Um I and and as you age, though I you know, I hate to reveal the, that, but <laughs> I am. And um you have some more sleep issues. Yes. And and so I have I have chased those little sheep for a long time mm. to try to get them to settle down. Mm. So let's talk about sleep. Yeah. What can people do? You know, like you said, you don't, you don't get, you may get the uh, reading, but you don't get the practical application. hundred percent. Yeah. So I think it's funny, you know, we all know pretty much we need seven to nine hours of sleep a night. Yeah. But just telling someone to sleep more is like, gee, thanks. <laughs> appreciate the advice. If I could, I would. Right. <laughs> I, I'll, let's start with this. Um, there's three things that sleep does. I think people really need to understand Then I'll give you some really practical tools. Number one, sleep helps with tissue regeneration. Mm. So while you sleep, you've probably heard of deep sleep before. Of course. That's called non-REM and deep sleep is phases three and four. And during deep sleep is when growth hormone is released. And growth yes. hormone is an anabolic hormone that heals tissues. Yes. Um, the second thing is there's this thing called the glymphatic <laughs> system in the brain. So you've heard of the <laughs> lymphatic system for the body. I have. And in the past decade, uh, researchers have found what's called the glymphatic system. It's these what we call paravascular pathways. When you sleep, your brain is literally flushing out metabolic waste products, some of which are associated with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Right. Um, and the third thing is big, big thing is it helps with learning and memory consolidation. So Mm -hmm. all the hard work that you put in place during the day, let's say you're trying to, uh, upskill yourself or you want to learn a new language or whatever. Yeah. When you sleep at night, your brain is actually expanding and contracting and, uh, it's, the reason it's expanding is the things that you learn during the day, it's strengthening those neuronal connections and those things are getting bigger and the things that you're not using are getting smaller. So all the hard work that you put in place during the day is concretely cemented into a neurological connection when you sleep. Hmm. So that's why sleep is so important. Go ahead. Which means that, you know, as I'm studying my little art history, I have a little art history class I'm taking. Oh, that's cool. I'm learning more about art history and my cooking skills are diminishing because <laughs> <laughs> I am not doing that. Yeah. So I am, I'm building up what I've paid attention to. Is that what you're yes. saying there? Yeah. It's finalized in sleep. And so if you're not consistently getting restful and fulfilling sleep, it's going to be uh, difficult to speed up the learning process. If you are, so here's here's the mechanism. You know, like when you're studying art history, like when you first start reading this challenging text, you may feel a sense of agitation. That's good. What's happening is, is you're getting a dump of um, adrenaline in the system. Hmm. And it's narrowing your focus. So focus is like a, a big light. And what you want to do is you want it to bring it to a spotlight on whatever you're studying. Fascinating. There's a neurochemical released in your brain called acetylcholine. And what it does is it goes out and marks those specific neurons that you're using during that learning to be strengthened when you go to sleep at night. Mm. So the first part is going through that agitation and frustration of the learning. And then when you go to bed at night, it's, 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 um, it's concrete, it's cemented, but 
a lot of people are like, okay, that's really cool. I know what happens during sleep. How do I get better sleep? Yeah. So the, the number one tip I can give you is what you do immediately upon waking is what will determine how well you sleep at night. I okay, know. let's go back there. Yeah. All right. So, so 14 cups of coffee are not going <laughs> to <laughs> that, that'll, that'll keep you up at Darn. night. Darn. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Um, I love my coffee, by the way. Yeah, me too. Um, so what I do upon waking, mm-hmm. I, you know, this is, you know, this is how you all, we all do. We listen to people and we're going, mm-hmm. okay, I know that answer. You know, yeah. it's going to be what I do before I go to sleep. Yes. No, what I do upon waking. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So there's these things called circadian rhythms. Yes. Okay. And a circadian rhythm is a 24 hour rhythm that occurs just on a, on a habitual basis. But there are things that anchor and can shift these rhythms and they're called Zeitgebers, German for time givers. The primary, and that can be temperature, humidity, light, exercise can change things. The primary time giver is light. So new neuroscience research demonstrates that when you wake up in the morning, you need to go outside and you need to get exposure to sunlight before 9 a.m. And, and here's why. There's this, um, this structure in the right above the roof of your mouth called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, SCN. Okay. I'm very impressed. Even at the <laughs> punctual, you know, the pronunciation of that. Wow. Okay. You know, you spend five years researching this. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah of course. So here's what I want everybody to know. When you see light, there's these special cells in your eyes, okay, that right. send a signal to this SCN that sends a signal to the ent- every single cell in your body that it's time to be alert. So you get a pulse in a hormone called cortisol, the stress hormone. Sure. But yeah. that's a good thing because that actually improves your alertness and your wakefulness. So before 9 a.m., you should get up and you should go outside. For at least... Five to ten minutes. Yeah, what's fascinating about this? I mean, this is the second time I've heard this today. Really? Believe that? Yeah. I was being driven here because I'm visiting um, the studio, and Natalie, who we both know, was telling me that she's doing one. uh, She's doing a um, a podcast with Marsha Gay Harden, her Uh aunt, and she was saying that they were studying sleep. Yeah. And that she shouldn't wear her sunglasses. Nope. Because she needs the the sunlight. To help wake her up. In the morning. Yeah. And also looking through. So you have to go outside because looking through a window. Doesn't do it. Is 50 times less effective. So you need about 100,000 lux of light. That's like a measurement of light. So if it's a really bright day, five to 10 minutes will do it. If it's really overclassed and cloudy, you could go outside for 10 minutes, come back in, go back outside. Artificial lights in your house are good in the morning. Oh. And that... What that does is two things. It gets you that pulse and cortisol so you feel alert during the day. But mm-hmm. then it also sets off this cascade of events that 12 to 16 hours later to increase melatonin. Ah, sleepy which hormone. helps you sleep. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you want natural secretion of melatonin, not, wow. ex- not exogenous intake. Yeah. 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 So here's a very interesting thing. There's That's a, fascinating. Yes. That's fascinating. Who would have known? I didn't, <laughs> except I did know it before I walked in yeah. today because I just heard it. Dang, Maybe. Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> she scooped you. <laughs> she did scoop me. But here's something cool. I found a paper uh, before we talked to so I was going to do some research. And there was a paper published in May in the Journal of American Medical Association, the journal Psychiatry. And it was conducted by researchers at the University of Colorado Boulder, MIT, and Harvard. And this is what they found. They found that people who tend to go to bed earlier and wake up earlier have a significantly lower risk of major depression. Interesting. It was the first paper that it was ever done that could actually link what's called your chronotype to the impact on depression. So some people naturally are morning people. Some people are, are evening people. They call them owls and larks. Sure. They studied over 840,000 people. Wow. And they got genetic data. This is a huge study. And they found that only about a, th- a third of people 
self-identify as a morning person. Only 9% identified as an evening person and the rest were kind of somewhere in between. And so they're like, okay, so for every hour earlier that somebody went to bed early, so like instead of staying up to 1 a.m., they went to bed at 12. Yeah. There was a 23% reduction in major depression That's symptoms. That's fascinating. And, and certainly it plays to mental health and yes. stop self-sabotage in, in this podcast. Um, it, it's, it's fascinating, too, because I have always been um, an, an owl. A never a lark. I mm. hated getting up. I mean, my mother used to pull me out of bed to go to school, kicking and screaming. And all the way through college, same way, all the way to da, 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 my, my college roommates used to kid me, you know, you're the only one who can get an A by just reading over somebody's shoulder <laughs> at lunchtime. You know, I mean, it's just, I mean, I couldn't get up. I didn't mm. get up. But now um, I, I go to sleep early. And I get up early. It's kind of a I natural switch. aging thing. Yeah, well, I'm afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just happens. It did. It yeah. did. So, so my depression right now is lower too. Much lower, it's especially good, with your coffee. Good to know. Good to know. Okay. So I'm better. Here's the crazy thing, though. I'm bringing this all back to that morning thing. The the researchers had a statement. They're like, okay, why is this? Sure. And they, they, their comment was, it all goes back to early morning sun exposure. So if you're waking up earlier, you're more likely to have natural light exposure, which then sets off this whole cascade of hormonal events that improve mood, improve alertness and wakefulness, and help you fall asleep better at night. So perfect. You can, if you can get early morning sun exposure before, before 9 a.m., I highly recommend five to 10 minutes if it's really bright. You know, the more you can get, the better. Yeah. You do this for two weeks, you're going to start feeling different. And then if you can actually get sun exposure 90 minutes, you know, between 90 minutes before the sun sets. So it's like you anchor it in the morning and you can kind of lock it in at the end of the day. It helps signal your brain, hey, <clears throat> it's time to shut it off. 90 minutes before it sets. Like within 90 minutes. So yeah. you can watch the sun go down, but it's like, you know, 90 minutes before all the way up to sunset. The quality of light in the morning and the evening are different and it sends different signals to our brain that says, hey, it's time to wake up. It's time to go to bed. It seems it seems very, you know, I mean, to use a word primitive, you know, that, yes. that, but I'm, I'm assuming that we, we pretty much are, I mean, our neural functioning hasn't been, you know, messed with for a long time. You know, we're pretty much what we were way back then. And we're still, we still are. I mean, humans weren't really domesticated <laughs> until the advent of air conditioning. You know what I'm saying? So even let's say up to the 1930s or forties, like, People would go outside because yeah. it was probably cooler. You get a breeze. Well, and I remember growing up as a kid, you know, I would go out and play. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, you worry about some of these kids who never see sun, right. you know, they're anyway, we won't go there. Um, fascinating stuff. Fascinating. So, so light exposure. And they also talk about that with international travel. They say, you know, you got to get up, you got to get on the rhythm that they're mm -hmm. on, you know, start moving around, get the sun, you know, get out. You can start phase shifting, mm. meaning like if you're having to travel and you want to be able to get up earlier, you could start waking up early and artificially uh, exposing yourself to Inducing light. that, yeah. Yeah. Exercising earlier in the morning. Yeah. yeah. You can start, you can start playing with all that kind of stuff and you know, shift workers. Uh, but that's like one of the simplest things. The other thing I'm going to tell you is, is that just how light wakes you up, it'll keep you up. And so um, bright light, expo any light exposure past 11 PM mm -hmm. activates a part of your brain called the habenula, also known as the disappointment nucleus. Really? Very interesting. What it does Gosh, is- Gosh, do I get a PhD after this? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm hoping your folks are going to walk away and be like, the disappointment wow. nucleus. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I want a certification just <laughs> listening. You're getting it. <laughs> but if you look at light past 11 p.m., it actually decreases dopamine levels in the brain, mm -hmm. which leads to demotivation. So they call it the disappointment nucleus because when you stimulate the habenula, mm -hmm. it lowers dopamine and people feel can have depressive 
symptoms. After 11 p.m. Between the hours of 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. So what are people often doing at night? Yeah. Social sure. media. Yeah. Yeah. So strongly suggest turning those things off. Um, another little trick is <clears throat> in your house as the evening goes on, like by 8 p.m., try to turn off overhead lights. Because these cells are called the melanopsin retinal ganglion cells. They're at the bottom of your eye. They sense light from above. So when you have an overhead light on, your brain doesn't know the difference between an overhead light and the sun. It's interesting. Because usually about that time, my husband and I are like watching a movie or doing yeah. something kind of cozy. And and the lights are off. And he's going. <laughs> 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 he doesn't have any problem with this deal. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. But it's, it, it's, it's fascinating because I'm very light sensitive. Mm. I, you know, in the morning, if there's light coming in at me, I'm You're like, up. yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I'm any more light sensitive than anyone else, um, but but to me, I can sleep through noise, but I can't sleep through light. Light's the primary time giver. It will. I'm the same way. It'll wake me up. And so for yourself, you know, those are the bookend things you can do. Also, the way that you set up your room. I'm probably sure you've heard of this. It's called sleep hygiene. Yes, just I just like you have good dental hygiene. Yes. You want to make your room cold, dark, and quiet like a cave. Yes. Yes. So the dark we've already talked about. Yes. The cold is really important. I love cold. Yes. And I now there's cold. there's cool products like Eight Sleep and these things like the Oolers that cool your bed. Because what happens when you sleep is your body temperature decreases, which helps increase melatonin. So for some people that are hot, hot natured, mm -hmm. if you can get in a temperature controlled environment, because like even if you pull those quilts over you, you're going to burn up. Yeah. So they put something over the bed and it artificially brings your temperature down, helps people get to sleep faster. Interesting. So your your thermostat should be 69 degrees or lower. Yeah, I love that. Love that. Are you listing my darling husband? <laughs> yeah, let's say he's getting the energy we, bill. We're fighting about their thermostat. I'm going, to, I want to be colder. Aren't you in California? I am. Is it hot where you are? Well, I'm in the desert, yes. Oh. It's called the desert for a reason. Yes. <laughs> Palm Desert, Palm Springs. Yeah, area. okay. It's warm. Yeah, so it's really hot. So cold, dark. And then quiet. So another trick people can do is, believe it or not, if you take a hot shower or bath before bedtime. Oh, I, I believe that. It reduces your body temperature. It, well, and it, it relaxes you. Yeah. You know, there's a there's that de-stressor as, as well. You yes. Know? I mean, for me, it's like, get it off. Get the day off. You know, mm. I want to get clean to go my cool sheets yeah. in my dark room in my cold cave. <laughs> <laughs> you need to have a routine to bring you down. Yeah. You know, and we're so overstimulated. We have all sorts of stress in our lives. Yeah. Everybody needs to have, some people like to journal. Some people like to uh, sip chamomile tea. Mm. I don't recommend alcohol. Um, it will, it may make you fall asleep faster, but you will up. not get into deeper levels of sleep. Um, it's yeah. impossible. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a tough one. Yeah, it is a tough one because there's cultural things and it does help some people kind of unwind mentally, but you need to have a, a pre-sleep routine. And I've got three boys. Uh, so I understand little, real life. Little ones. I mean, I've got a nine, a five and a one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> my wife's a saint. You have what's called chaos. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we get them to bed early and so we can go to bed early. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of our thing. We don't really watch TV during the week. Um, there's just no energy for it right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're you're handling a lot of energy systems. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> God bless. I've done all that, so I'm I'm not doing that. <laughs> but um, okay, so there's the, is that the nugget of sleep and the yeah. the issue around depression. I love that mm -hmm. information. Wow. Well, I do, I know when I don't sleep well. I mean, the next day is is I am I'm beating myself internally to just keep going. You know, mm -hmm. just just one more hour, one mm -hmm. more hour. What about um, naps? So glad you brought that up. Oh, <laughs> I love cute naps. cards. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, that wasn't in my notes, but that's one of my favorite things. So, <laughs> um, naps are really beneficial. And here's the thing: you don't really even have to fall asleep. So people are like, oh, I don't have time to, you know, take a nap. I'm very busy. 
Research demonstrates that you get a cognitive mental performance boost, improves your mood, improves mood appropriate behaviors, meaning like you're going to be better with your colleagues. Mm -hmm. Um, Keep naps less than 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Or else you're going to- you know, I mean, yeah. sometimes when you just, I mean, like the other day, I just went out for an hour and a half and I was like, what world am I in? <laughs> yeah. It's called sleep inertia. Oh, hello. <laughs> yeah. And you want to, you do not want to have that. Cause then mm-hmm. like, especially if you're taking a late afternoon nap, like a four and you wake up at five something, mm-hmm. you're like, is it tomorrow or yeah. is it today? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So before 3 PM short 15 minute nap, um, will boost your, uh, your memory will boost your your cognitive performance. And if you really want to wake up feeling great, um, you can, I call it a, a nappuccino. <laughs> so what you do is. <laughs> I love Hi, that. I'm going to have my nappuccino. We should sell this, Brandon. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So you put it on one of your fingers there. No question. <laughs> so what you do is, is um, caffeine. So when you, there's two, there's a couple different ways that your body like feels this pressure for sleep, but one of them is a chemical pressure. And there's this molecule called adenosine that builds up during the day. So the pressure builds and builds and builds. And when you go to bed at night, it goes down. <clears throat> well, caffeine competes with adenosine receptors in your brain. So that's one of the reasons why when you drink caffeine, you feel more alert because mm-hmm. this pressure goes down. So- uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Allison Brager, she um, is a neuroscientist in the Army, and they did all sorts of research at Walter Reed uh, for soldiers on, you know, that are operating in austere conditions on optimal nap duration mm-hmm. and caffeine consumption mm-hmm. that's healthy. So you don't need to go out and drink some. I do not recommend energy drinks, but 200 milligrams yeah, are left. Like those. Oh, they just make you twitch. They're neurodegenerative. Really? Yeah. The, uh, so you're slugging those to stay awake to do an exam or something, and uh, and you know, um, and you were you were eating up neuro the brains, brain cells. Yeah, they've actually found that soldiers that drink two or more a day actually have higher risk of depression, anxiety, and they're more fatigued. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So the number one consumer of energy drinks in the world, the U.S. military. Really? Mm-hmm. Sad, isn't it? <clears throat> Gosh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I so, was thinking college kids, but yeah. Probably or number two is college kids. Uh, truck drivers. Truck drivers, right. Yeah. You need to stay away from them. Caffeine is not a bad thing unless if you, as long as you don't have a caffeine sensitivity. Yeah. But if you were to drink like one espresso or a cold eight ounce cup of coffee right before you take a nap, what happens is you get the cognitive benefits of the nap. You don't wake up feeling that weird feeling because the adenosine block and you'll wake up ready to hit the ground running. This is so paradoxical. (laughs) Drink caffeine before you nap. (laughs) Right before you nap, chug it. For all the parents out there that are like, I am so tired. I don't know how I'm going to do this. It, you know, if you're not nursing, if your doctor agrees, you know, a small amount, you don't need a lot. Like I'm talking less than like 120 milligrams, which is like an eight ounce cup. Drink it cold. Right before you take a nap, go lay down, you will wake up and set your alarm for less than 30 minutes and you will wake up feeling phenomenal and be able to finish out the day. This is such great information. Wow. I mean, I would be doing either or as I think people would. Mm-hmm. I mean, for, for me, I thought, hey, it's healthier to take a nap than have a shot of caffeine at three o'clock. Yeah. That could upset my sleep. Could, yes. Yeah. So so if I'm being sleep conscious, which I try to be, um, I would take my nap and not the caffeine. Yeah, but, you could definitely do both. Some people yeah. aren't as sensitive. Yeah. So like I'm not super caffeine sensitive. Um, and so I'll have, you know, two cups in the morning and then a cup in the afternoon. I'm actually trying to do even less than that, which anything, believe it or not, the literature shows anything less than five a day oh, is okay. My I, my mother is was of Norwegian descent. Those people were knocking it back all day long. She she would drink it at midnight and fall asleep immediately. You, you know why? No, I do here's, not. Here's my thought process. <laughs> Anytime I talk about the sunlight thing, mm, yeah, I've been in front of international audiences, there are always people from the UK and up in the Netherlands. And they're always like, well, no wonder we're always tired or we have higher risk of depression because there's no yeah, sun. There's no sun. And so what are yeah. you going to try to augment with? A stimulant. Yeah, caffeine. That would that's just my uh, hypothesis. Hmm. 
Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. So I'm assuming that if we get good sleep and mm-hmm. we're out there in the morning, light before 9 a.m., mm-hmm. and we want to get some time in the sun, we should be exercising. Yes. What do you think? 100%. <laughs> um, exercise, I mean, I think everybody knows that it's it's very healthy for you, but one of the things in relationship to the topic that you talk on a lot, and this is something that's come to my my um, come across just recently, about a year ago, my sister was telling me about, have you heard of NSDR? So, NSDR. So it's a light board. So people that are going through oh, yeah, psychotherapy, sure. yeah, it's yeah. like this light that goes mm-hmm. back and forth. There was a researcher. EMDR. EMDR? Well, I don't know. I well, there is EMDR, mm-hmm. and I, I don't know about, about and is, I know about treating people with um, with light. Yes, since, with light who who have S, uh, who have sad. Okay, seasonal affective disorder. Okay, and they treat them with light boards and light, you know, uh, lights. Yeah, what this is, it's like a. Um if you had like little nodes on a board, it would go back and forth. And what you would do is you would follow it with your eyes like this. Yeah, we are being hypnotized. Yeah. Well, what they found was is there's a research at Stanford that found that like when you walk <laughs> outside mm-hmm. or you bike or whatever, you get into a state called optic flow, which means that your eyes are kind of moving side to side as things pass you. Sure. What that does is it dampens neural circuits in your brain, like the amygdala, the fear centers in your brain, Mm. and it reduces anxiety. So what they now have people doing is as they're processing traumatic events, they're using these NSDR boards because it helps put them in optic flow. So I think, yeah, yeah. I start my morning with a walk. Yeah. Because it helps reduce anxiety. It kind of gets my mind into a state of like, Alert calmness, mm-hmm. which yes. is where I want to be. Okay. Sure. I want to sure. be alert, but I don't want to be like paranoid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there, that is a spectrum there. Yeah. yeah. But you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I do. I do. I being do. under control so that I can make really good decisions. Yeah. Well, for sure. And um, and I did that as well and loved it. Um, the walk. And now I have plantar fasciitis Ugh. and I, you know, it hurts to walk. I'm sorry. I got to figure out something else. Yeah. Swimming, but I'm not a great swimmer. So we'll work on it. I'll work on it. You could do a seated recumbent bike or something. I could. Yeah. I could. That's my mom's. That's her thing now. That's her go-to. Yeah. Well, yeah, it helps your back, right? Yeah. You know, us people who are, you know, have, um, have aging joints. Mm-hmm. It's an important thing to keep those lubricated and healthy. And no question. Healthy. So, okay, exercise. Um, and what else does exercise do, Eric? You've studied this, I know, in depth with athletes and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But I'm just talking for normal people, not for not for anyone who's trying to achieve maximum. No, hundred percent. I yeah. mean, it helps with um, uh, prevent metabolic issues like type two diabetes. Sure. Systemic inflammation. Sure. Heart disease. So here's the thing. Like when I think we'd all agree when you stop moving, you die. Yeah. So the great thing about exercise <clears throat> is you're moving fluid. People mm. that, not only through your heart, but you're moving fluid around joints because like like your joints don't get direct blood flow. So the only way like and I'm I'm 41. I play college football. I do jujitsu. So my my joints hurt sometimes like shoulders and stuff. Yeah. The only way to get fluid into those joints is through movement. And that's what kind of creates Got this it. this like hydraulic system. So when you're sitting and not being active, your joints get stiff and achy. <clears throat> um, it improves your sleep quality, helps prevent insomnia. Yes, of course. Yeah. And yeah. so, <clears throat> and there's a special type of exercise I wanted to highlight. It's called zone two. Okay. So... If you, um, it's a, it's, it's a specific heart rate range. So if you can calculate your max heart rate, which is 220 minus your age. So I'm 41. Let's just make it 40. So that's 180 beats a minute. Zone two is between 50 to 75% of your max heart rate. So for me, that's what, uh, 90 to 120 beats, 130 beats a minute. If you can do aerobic exercise in that zone, 
what happens is, is it affects something called your parasympathetic nervous system, sure. which is that rest and digest state that we all want to be in. We want to shift from being on uh, fight or flight back to parasympathetic. Right. It also increases something called cardiac output, which is the amount of blood your heart can beat every minute. So if you want to reduce your risk of heart disease, increasing cardiac output, every doctor is going to want to tell you that. And that's yeah. not a really intense exercise range. Yeah. Okay. It's just enough. You shouldn't be out of breath. So if you were to go on it with a friend on a, on a brisk walk, right? you should be able to talk, but you should feel your heart beating. Yeah. That's yeah. zone two. That's zone two. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. So let's zone two. Let's, um, you know, let's get out in the morning and get some sunlight in our yes. eyes. Um, so let's talk. We, we have just a little bit of time left. Mm -hmm. I'm, I want to have you back. This is so fascinating. Let's do it. Truly. All right. We're, 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 I just want to go home with you. And everything. <laughs> okay. So talk about eating. Oh. And as it applies to, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the psychology of self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can sabotage your sleep. You can sabotage your your exercise, mm -hmm. which I'm pretty good at. And uh, you can <laughs> sabotage your eating. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about that. What, I mean... There's always a new diet. Yeah. I am I am diet overload. It's like I keto, bleh, this plant, that plant, no yeah. none of this, that whatever. What do you think is a good, healthy, mm -hmm. you know, diet? Yes. I want to mention two things. Let's talk about that. And then I want to talk about a mindset thing that I think would help people. The first thing is is eating predominantly whole foods. I'm not talking organic. I'm just saying whole foods, things that come from there. So if you go to your grocery store, if you stay on the perimeter of the store, <laughs> think about it. The that's perimeter. All. Where, where all the or where the produce is. Yeah, you take a right, you hit your produce. You keep going, you hit your meat. <laughs> then you hit your dairy and your eggs. You know what I'm saying? Is, are they all like that? Almost every grocery store is set up I the same. I never knew that. I just started thinking about it. This just hit me right now. On the perimeter. Yeah, I've never. To the perimeter. It's always that. The perimeter is always the whole foods. The well, that's end, true. It's the all end, the process. It's this cereals and crackers and right. white frozen stuff. foods. Yeah, everything. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, almost every store you walk into, you hang a right, you hit your produce. Do the perimeter. I yeah. love that. Uh, except for Walmart. Um, it's <laughs> it's actually Walmart's on the left. Uh, but yeah, so consuming five servings a day of fruits and or vegetables. Yeah, well, that's tough. So here's what I tell us. people. Eat the rainbow. So just yellow, red, purple. Yes. All of those things have different micronutrients in it that are just excellent for your body. Antioxidant stuff. You don't have to, you don't have to know all the science. Eat the, the rainbow. rainbow. Stay eat, in the perimeter. Eat, eat the, the rainbow. rainbow. Buy it before you eat it on the perimeter. <laughs> <laughs> Take it home. Yes. Yeah. Then so salads, so fruits, so, you know. Meats. Mi Make meat? sure every single time you eat, you have some kind of protein. Protein, yeah. And I'm big on protein. Protein will help you uh, with, uh, it's going to help with retaining muscle, which you definitely need. Uh, because, you know, as you start to age, muscle starts to decrease. That keeps your metabolic rate up. It helps keep your strength. <clears throat> as you age, prevents things like falling. Number two, it's going to help with um, with uh, your bone density. Mm -hmm. um, big issue for women. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. In a lot of women, I, I, okay, I, I the women in my men, life don't eat a lot of protein. I expect men too. Yeah. But I, I don't know that. But I know when I go to my gynecologist, I have a bone density test. And I, yes. Because it, what I read somewhere is that when you when people, uh, you know, and elderly people fall, it's not that they fell. It's that their hips cracked. Right. And then they fall. And so the things that you get in cell. proteins are going to help with that. Yeah. Yeah. The, a lot of the stuff you get out of the fruits and vegetables like magnesium and calcium stuff and from dairy is going to help with bone mineral density. Good. Uh, the protein also helps fill you up. And then things like healthy fats. Yeah. Avocado. Avocado. Olive oils. Yeah. Um, I highly recommend um, fish oil for everybody. And specifically, you want to get a thousand milligrams a day of EPA. So there's two types of fats in there in a fish oil. There's DHA and EPA. Yeah. One you, EPA. Yes. <clears throat> Research shows that a thousand milligrams a day can help limit depressive symptoms. 
Um, fish oil. Yes. So go to bed early and eat a fish. <laughs> go to bed early, <laughs> eat some fish. If you just stick to the outside of the grocery store, right? Yeah. If you eat protein with every meal, you eat the rainbow and you get some healthy fats. Like you're well on your way. That's what. I, that's how I eat. That's great. I didn't hear cake though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, here's the other thing too, and this is what I want to. This is the mindset piece. Okay. Two parts of this. My good friend of mine, Amanda Nybert, who I think you would love to have on. Okay. She did a TED Talk recently on something called the all or nothing mindset. And this is what kills, oh, quote, absolutely. dieters. It's like yeah. they get to Friday and they're like, oh, I went out and had a hamburger in this net. And they're like, well, might as, might as well just blow the rest of the weekend. I blew it. So yeah. why not? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's this all or nothing mindset. The other thing, too, is like. I can only eat healthy foods all the time. And so then I have these, quote, cheat meals. No, it's not cheating. It's living life. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. People have birthdays, you know, and and I would think in moderation. Yeah. Then a little dark chocolate or just sure. a, a few little uh, hot tamales, my favorite go-to. Yeah. At night for that little sweet taste you want. There's nothing Come wrong on. with that. Come on. 80-20 is kind of the rule. If 80% of the time you're eating things that are in line with a healthy diet, yeah. and then 20% of the time you have your hot tamales or have your french fries, that's totally fine 80, and totally 20. normal. I love that. And if we get out of whack mentally about what reality is and what it's not, like it leads to very unhealthy patterns of eating and sure. and like you have just unhealthy relationships with food. Yes. And we all have fluctuations in our body. Our weight goes up, our weight goes down because of travel and maybe you retaining a little water from this side to the other. It's totally normal. Yeah. And so I think that's one of the things because of social media and we we get we get ideas about what the body should look like. Yeah. It's totally messed yeah. up. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree with you there, Eric. And I think when when you're mm -hmm. looking at all these things, mm -hmm. okay, and you're gonna get out of balance somewhere sometime. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a compensatory mechanism internally, which is to access that nurturing parent in you. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're one of your little sons fell down and really hurt themselves, you wouldn't come over and just start criticizing them. No. You come over and go, oh, honey, oh, I'm here. I'm kiss you. We'll make it better. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, there's your boo-boo or whatever. I mean, that's yeah. what nurturing parents do. Right. But what happens when we mess up and how do we treat ourselves? We're horrible. We're horrible. We're critical. Mm -hmm. We re we wag that finger mm -hmm. at ourselves, say bad things and, and throw ourselves into that sort of whirlwind of self-despair. Mm -hmm. And, um, and sabotage. So then to make ourselves feel better, you know, we go have a couple glasses of wine and, uh, and then something else, you know. Mm, we're not really dealing with the issue. We Well, we aren't. And we're not accepting the humanity is not perfect. Mm. We are not perfect. No. Any of us. I've never, somebody said, well, I'm just trying to be perfect. I said, why? You're never going to get there. No. <laughs> I mean, no. Go for 98%. That's still an A. Shoot in, for excellence. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Leave this perfect stuff on the shelf or whoever told you. By the way, they weren't perfect either. No. Yeah. <laughs> which no. which uh, we come to find out. So, yeah, be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. Accept that we're not going to sleep well every night. We're not going to eat well every day. We're not going to exercise all the time. You know, it's just not going to happen. No. But to maximize the choice internally to do it right 80% of the time. That's exactly right. Life is going to come at you. We have three kids. Sometimes you just don't get enough sleep. I bet. Guess what? If the other days of the week, let's say you have two nights that are bad and you got eight nights mm -hmm. that are great, man, you're making progress. Sure. And so like a lot of parents, especially my age right now, like to beat themselves up because of this, this, or this, you're like, look, just put in healthy habits. Chill. And if you have a stable baseline, life is going to have these ups and downs. Yeah. Sometimes it's going to be awesome. Sometimes it's going to be really hard work and family demands. I mean, you can only exercise twice this week, but you did it four times last <clears throat> week. Guess what? You're trending in the right direction. Exactly. So Exactly. Well said. Yeah. Well said. And, you know, God bless when they all get sick. You know, I mean, geez. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 
But they probably don't in your house. <laughs> no, I mean, we still get sick. We got, you know, our kids go to church, you know, in the preschools and they oh. come back and it's like, well, we all just got the cold. Oh, <laughs> they ran yeah. around. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. OK, so um, we're talking about self-sabotage. Mm-hmm. And uh, how do you as you treat people and mm-hmm. you have a consulting business? Mm-hmm. Do you have clients? Then I don't really do one on one consulting. I'll do public speaking and then everything is through AIM 7. Um, okay. As far as like how we're serving people right now. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, so www.aim, A-I-M, I just spell it out, yeah. seven dot uh-huh. com. Yep. For and then, and then Dr. They can, Eric Corum. Yeah. And then you can follow me on Instagram at, at Eric Corum. I have, I put a ton of content out there. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Well, this has just been so delightful, Eric. Thank, Thank you for you having so me much. on. Oh, fun. Good fun. I've yeah. learned so much. And, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to share it with uh, people out there and my family and yeah. and all the folks listening. Um, and we're going to have you back uh, because it. we need to. These are the things we need to do deep dives on mm. um, because it really is lifestyle that brings us to mental health, mm-hmm. you know, or destroys us. No question. I mean, don't sleep. Eat badly. You know, I can make anybody depressed. You know, <laughs> go in a room, watch TV all day, eat uh, Fritos and drink, you know, lots of uh, Diet Coke. D- don't get any sunlight. Uh, don't talk to anybody. And down you go. No question. Yeah. Yeah. So depression is largely, well, of course, there's systemic depression, of course. But we make it ourselves. Mm. And if we make it, we can unmake it. No so question. That's what we're all trying to do here. Sleep well, eat well, exercise. Thank you so much for having me on. This hey, is a pleasure. My my pleasure, really. Thanks for listening. You can find more episodes and all of our other Hot Pie Media originals baked fresh daily at our home online at hotpiemedia.com, the Hot Pie Media YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to podcasts.